Northerners and Southerners question forcefully whether the regions wrested from Mexico ought to be open to subjugation. And a few Southerners even undermined severance. Standing firm. Zachary Taylor was ready to keep the association intact by furnished force as opposed to by think twice about. Brought into the world in Virginia in 1784, he was taken as a baby to Kentucky and raised on an estate. He was a lifelong official in the military, yet his discussion was most frequently of cotton raising. His house was in Implement Rouge, Louisiana, and he claimed an estate in Mississippi. However, Taylor didn't protect subjugation or southern sectionalism. Forty years in the military made him a solid patriot. He spent a fourth of a century policing the outskirts against Indians. In the Mexican conflict he won significant triumphs at Monterey and Buena Vista President Polk. Upset by Broad Taylor's casual propensities for order and maybe his wiggery too. Kept him in northern Mexico and sent an endeavor under Genwin Field Scott to catch Mexico City. Taylor, enraged felt that the skirmish of Buena Vista opened the way to the city of Mexico and the lobbies of Montezuma, that others could delight in them. Old crude but effective's natively constructed ways were political resources. His long military record would engage northerners. His responsibility for slaves would bait southern votes. He had not committed himself on inconvenient issues. The Whigs named him to go against the vote-based competitor, Louis Cass who inclined toward letting the occupants of regions choose for themselves whether they needed slavery. In challenge Taylor the slaveholder and cast the supporter of vagrant power, northerners who went against expansion of subjection into domains framed a free soil party and selected Martin Van Buren. In a nearby political decision, the free soilers pulled an adequate number of votes from Cass to choose Taylor. In spite of the fact that Taylor had bought into Whig standards of regulative authority, he was not lean to be a mannequin of Whig pioneers in Congress. He acted on occasion like he were above gatherings and legislative issues. As rumpled as usual, Taylor attempted to run his organization in a similar guideline style with which he had battled Indians. Customarily, individuals could conclude whether they needed bondage when they drew up new state constitutions. Subsequently, to end the disagreement about bondage in new regions, Taylor encouraged pioneers in New Mexico and California to draft constitutions and apply for statehood. By passing the regional stage, Southerners were incensed. Since neither state constitution was probably going to allow servitude, individuals from Congress were daunted, since they felt the president was usurping their approach-making privileges. Furthermore, Taylor's answer disregarded a few intense side issues the northern aversion of the slave market working in the region of Colombia, and the southern requests for a more tough outlaw slave regulation. In February 1850 President Taylor had held a blustery gathering with southern pioneers who undermined severance. He let them know that if important to implement the regulations, he actually would lead the military. People taken in disobedience to the association, he would hang with less hesitance than he had hanged traitors and spies in Mexico. He won't ever falter. Then, at that point, occasions went off in a strange direction. In the wake of taking part in services at the Washington Landmark on a rankling July 4, Taylor became sick. In the span of five days he was dead. After his demise, the powers of give and take won. However the conflict Taylor had been willing to confront came eleven years after the fact. In it, his main child Richard filled in as an overall in the Confederate Armed Force.